Thank you for coming to attend our public seminar uh, on comparative perspectives of on educational policies in small states. And today we have our guest lecture is Professor Michael Crossley. Uh, he's the Professor of Comparative and International Education at the University of Bristol. And uh, today, uh, Professor Crossley is here with us. Uh, he's uh, the external supervisor for our first uh, full-time PhD student at the Faculty of Education as well as the university. And uh, so we are very fortunate to have him with us and agreeing to give this special talk on his research area. And in addition, uh, as we've come to know, Professor Crossley wears many hats, and among that, he is a director of the Research Center for International and Comparative Studies and the director of the Specialist Education in Small States Research Group at the University of Bristol, as well as he is the director for the Doctor of Education program uh, at the university. And uh, he has suc uh, successfully supervised over 30 uh, PhD students, and he's it's also widely published in the area with over 30 books and over 200 articles. So as you can you know, he's a, a, a very uh, renowned expert in the area. And we are indeed very fortunate that he will bring with him uh, the high standards we expect from our PhD program. And uh, today we've had the uh, defense of uh, the, the PhD proposal defense for our uh, PhD student Sunina Rashid, and have heard it's been quite successful today, so congratulations. And uh, uh, so uh, I'll now call upon Professor Crossley, so I'll give the floor to him to give his, uh, his talk on his recent research. Well, um, thank you very much for that kind introduction in the first instance. Thank you for those kind words. Um, by way of introduction, let me say a second thank you, and that is to the Chancellor, the Vice-Chancellor, all members of the university community here for the invitation to do the presentation in the first place. Um, I feel welcome because when I look around the room, I can see faces that I know. Um, and it's a pleasure to see all former students from the University of Bristol in the UK and Dr. Anwar, I can see somewhere there. And current students, I'm looking for Muna. Where is Muna? Muna's there. So I feel as though I'm among friends, uh, and I must say that. I, I will also say a thank you as well to uh, Dr. Sharif, who's been the chief organizer for my visit and helped to set up a program that has been, a, still is, a very busy schedule throughout these, uh, these days of this week. But thank you to all of those people in different ways. Um, now, before I, before I begin, I, I have this wired up microphone so that I can walk a little bit and still talk to you and I can look at my own slides as well. And I should therefore be able to do it without having to wear the glasses, which is always an advantage. Um, but there's a few things I, I probably want to say with that slide that we've got on the, on the screen at the moment. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll use this little pointer. Um, as in, in the introduction, my, my field is, I'm a professor of comparative and international education, but I have other specialisms that connect to why we're doing this sort of research. One of those specialisms is, is theoretical and methodological developments in the field of comparative and international education. So that's like a broad umbrella for the sort of stuff that I do. A second specialism is educational development in small states. And small states are categorized by the size of population, typically. I'll be saying a little bit more about that in the talk itself. And why small states? Well, it's partly my biography, my background. For all of the 1980s and ever since then, I've been connected very closely, family-wise, in all sorts of ways, with the uh, South Pacific, and particularly with the nation state of Papua New Guinea, which is located just north of Australia. And that meant I was living and working within small states communities and gradually got to understand that the priorities, the concerns, the challenges that small states have are often very different to other parts of the world. 
Um, and the third one, which probably connects to the, to the other events today, and I, I, I need to congratulate Sunina for a, a good presentation today and a, a successful day for you as well. Um, but my, my third sort of role is supporting the development of research capacity in education systems around the world. And that can be in many different places where I do have connections and links, but it's in particular in different small states of the world. And that could be in the South Pacific. It also includes the Caribbean, the Indian Ocean. And there are other small states dotted around the world that I hope this presentation will help you realize, hey, we're part of a big community here. Small states, big community, it's that sort of story. Um, I think those are the, the, the basic introductions that I, I want to, uh, to use. But while we look at that uh, slide there, let's do um, the University of Bristol. Yeah, um, and that is the Graduate School of Education building at the University of Bristol. For those who are friends in the audience will know the place. Does it look like home, a second home, Dr. Ramo? Um, and that is the Wills Memorial building. And those that graduate, we have a great hall, and that's the graduation hall. So the picture on the first slide actually tells a few stories um, that I hope you find uh, useful. So that's very much in the center of the city of Bristol. There's one other thing. Oh, it's not quite visible at the bottom of the slide. Somewhere down here it says um, smallstates.net. And if you Google smallstates.net, that takes you into the the work, it's like a website for our specialist research group on education and development in small states. So it's a key resource that people could, uh, could use and look at. So what are we going to do today? The title of the presentation is Education in Small States, Policies and Priorities. And the title is really important in the, the nuance in there. It's not external people's views about the priorities in education in small states. This is a story, this is research that is reporting what people in small states across the globe, worldwide, have been saying are their priorities. So while I'm a professor of comparative and international education, I may well study global trends, global targets like the Millennium Development Goals many people would have heard of, while I'm much aware of those things, the research that we've been carrying out is usually grounded in what people in a particular context believe is their priority or are their priorities. So the book that came from this study, I have a hard copy here. And at the end of uh, my visit, this is one of the books that I'm going to leave with a little collection, a way of saying thank you for the hospitality that I've enjoyed here as well. But that's the book that reports the study. And it's not a great big, thick, heavy tome. Believe me, it's harder to write a small book than it is to write a big book. What we were trying to do here was report findings in a way that they're accessible to those who could use them, the findings. So it's written so that a busy minister could even look at it. It's written in a style that the public servants that need to sort of get their heads around the priorities that they're dealing with, find out what's going on elsewhere, could, could use. But it has to be credible academically as well. Now, that's a hard game to play. So you've got to please the academics who always want you to write a little bit more, and you have to please the decision makers who always want you to write a little bit less. Okay, so there was a trick in, in catching that book. You can see reviews. If you are connected to the academic journals, you'll find it's been reviewed in many, many journals, and you can see what the reviewers have to say. I'm working to about 45 minutes for the presentation, and then maybe 15, 20 minutes for any questions and discussion, if, if that's forthcoming. The book, the, the authors of the book, the author team, their names are there. Um, some of them have long experience of work in small states. Um, I know your vice chancellor knows uh, uh, Professor Mark Bray very well, or, or you've had connections with. Um, some of these other people are working for UNESCO. Mindy Collin is actually a doctoral researcher working in Mauritius, and she's a Mauritian. Um, 
I'll say no more about that, but I think the last point about th that slide is that the work we've done it draws upon a team of about 80 people. So it's the voices of about 80 researchers across the small states of the Commonwealth that are part of this team. So what am I going to do? This is the structure, the route map, the plan for the presentation. First of all, we say a little bit more about definitions, what are small states and their distinctive characteristics. Secondly, I'll say something about educational research that's been carried out in small states, wherever it's been done. Thirdly, I'll say something about the origins and nature of the, oh, I've hit a bottom. I'm not sure what that's going to do. Ah, there we go. Um, the origins and nature of this research project. Then I will tell you something about the findings. What have we learned from that study? And then it's the implications of the study and the findings. What does it mean? You know, what does it mean, I think, you've got to think for Maldives? And that's where I want you to connect to whatever I say. Things I'm going to be saying are apparently about priorities for education and policy directions in small states. You challenge that. You know, ask the question, does this speak a little bit like Maldives or not? You know, how might, uh, and we might well be different, but in what ways might you connect to this and say, yeah, hey, hold on, I do think that's important here as well. So, definitions. The Commonwealth has a classification. Definitions can be slippery. The Commonwealth is very slippery with this one. Look at it. Their definition is, it's saying 32 of their member countries, they're classified as small states. And then they adopt the definition of, this is the figure, 1.5 million people or less. And then, uncomfortably, the Commonwealth realizes they don't all fit into that category. What about Papua New Guinea? 20 years ago, it was 3 million people, still too big. The population in Papua New Guinea, 7 million nearly now. So it's, it's moved beyond the official figure. But the Commonwealth has recognized that, and it's recognized that Jamaica in the Caribbean is also bigger. And so are these others, um, uh, Lesotho. Namibia, but well, Namibia is only very interesting. It's a huge landmass, but they, the population is still relatively small, so they've made their own definition. These are their words. Look, I put the quotation marks around it, so they add those additional states because they argue they share similar characteristics, they share similar problems. I have very close friends throughout all of Papua New Guinea. I have. We have an adopted son in Papua New Guinea. We had so many doctoral students from Papua New Guinea that have followed me to Bristol and then come back there. But when I talk to people in Papua New Guinea about being part of the small states grouping, they are saying, and the ministers are saying this too, yeah, we want to stay part of that group. We share development priorities. We share goals with the islands of the South Pacific. And if the islands of the South Pacific are going to get together and say, we have a common argument, a common voice, Papua New Guinea wants to stay in the, in the pack. So definitions, a little bit slippery story, but so yeah, where are the small states in the world? I, I, maybe you guys all know. Maybe this is an audience that does know, but sometimes I can use a slide like this and it makes people stand up. There are a lot of small states following that definition worldwide and they're all over the globe. Let's just have a look what we've got here. They're in Africa. Here's those with <coughs> 1.5 million or less. Here's those with 1.5 up to 5 million. If you take 5 million as maybe the top, the biggest level that you could go with population. Do you know these places? Have you heard of them? You know, there's very smaller ones are the ones that people often say, oh, yeah, where's that? No, I'm not quite sure. Is that off the coast of Africa or, or not? You know? Then there's the Americas, there's the Arab state, small states, there's the Atlantic small states. Some of them might be independent nations, some might be still colonial dependencies, that's a strange word to use. There are 13, I think, 
British overseas territories still. But the decolonization story shifted. Many of those overseas territories are saying, no, 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 we don't want to be independent. Not like it was some time ago when the pressures were, we want our own voice, we want. There are very complex, different stories. That's, that's not the full story, there are plenty more. The Asian region, the Caribbean region. You, by the colors and the size of the, size of the blocks, you can see where most small states are. They are falling into the Caribbean, the South Pacific as the two biggest groupings. There's my little web. So oh, no, even there, it's still, still missing. It's here, look, just in the black. Where are we now? Europe. So we're not confined to low-income countries. We might be talking about islands very often, which is bringing it close to home here, Maldives. The Indian Ocean, you're in there, look. I should have checked, shouldn't I? I should have checked you were on the list, but you're there, you're there. And the Pacific, and the Pacific. So the small states of the world, they might have very few people in terms of the giants of India and China, but there are many, many small state, nation states in the globe. And part of our research has begun to help to bring their voices more to the international community, to say this is potentially marginalized communities from influencing international debates. And yet there could be many, many important things that the broad, bigger world can learn from the small state experience. And you'll find that's running through a lot of the things I want to say. Here's a few quick facts. You know, this is like, I'll test you afterwards. I'll, I'll do a question. No, I won't. But a few quick facts about small states. Sometimes it makes people, oh, I didn't know that. There are 120 states in the world with populations below 5 million. 51 of the 120 are small island developing states. And that's another subcategory of small states. It's a subcategory that UNESCO use. They've identified that, and it's an acronym. You know, you get the capital letters. SIDS, S-I-D-S, small island developing states. And UNESCO has recognized that priority attention does need to be given to the distinctive challenges, priorities, futures, things we can learn from, say this, on small island development. The last bullet point is probably important because it's saying there's a broad range of economic and human development indicators. So they're not all poor countries, they're not all rich countries, there are real differences. Here's one, Tuvalu. Anybody got friends in Tuvalu? Possibly we do, you know, we travel the world. We... But Tuvalu has some similar problems to those that I'm learning. Even in the last 15 minutes before this lecture began, we were looking at the map of Maldives and realizing, and I'm learning all the time, you know, sea level rise of a very small Tuvalu is similarly placed. It's an atoll type of community in the Pacific, in this case. Tuvalu's population, uh, I'll just give you exactly the population, is 10,837 people, you know, thereabouts, 11,000 people. But with a very, very small rise in sea level, if you're thinking educational planning or educational futures, small rise in sea level and Tuvalu's gone. So it's not a case of educational planning, it's strategic planning for the nation disaster preparedness, and maybe that's where priority for education, perhaps, but I'm going to come weave back to such things. But they're not all like Tuvalu. So some small states might be relatively rich nation state of Malta, located in the, um, in the Mediterranean. So you can see the map above gives you the location here. The population for Malta is 452,000. 
Now, I've been asking, you know, what are the recent statistics for Maldives, but is it 360,000 or more, up, up a bit, or down, a bit lower? Low? Around that, but so Malta is not too far away in, in terms of population size. That, that's the reason I was just trying to bring Maldives into the story there. And then you can go to one of the bigger small states in terms of well, land mass and population um, in the Caribbean, and that's Jamaica. And Jamaica's a, pro I'll give you a, a simplified figure, about three million people. And Jamaica plays a similar role in the Caribbean to the role played by Papua New Guinea in the Pacific. It's a bit of the giant, the economic giant, the bigger, bigger nation state in a group of, a regional group of small states. There are some others. I'm trying to show here with these slides that I have to be really careful. I'm not going to be presenting to you suggesting that all small states are the same that all small state priorities will be the same. They have differences. So we must remember, that's the health warning on the, on, the, on the lecture, on the presentation. We must remember they do have differences. However, the bigger story is that small states have a lot in common. And coming together, coming together with a joint voice, a joint position, supporting each other, and we're thinking particularly in terms of educational development and strategies for the future, strengthens the arm, can strengthen the arm of the small states communities across the globe. Yeah, I mean, that's quite a, an interesting list in itself. Armenia, where is Armenia? You know, how many of us in the room know? But it's, it's, it would be a category of a post-Soviet small state in Central Europe. So they're not all islands either, for that matter. But now I want to come to the distinctive characteristics that they're things they have in common. And this is taken from the literature. And those of you that are researchers, if you're doing a doctoral research proposal plan, you know you've got to connect to a body of literature that will help you with your research. The body of literature on small states and education in small states suggests that they do remoteness and isolation communities in small states is quite a frequent characteristic. Maldives, you know, you're the expert. Think through, does, does that characteristic ring a bell? Does it connect? Certainly to some of your communities. Many are islands, the 51 SIDS. Another thing, key priority that many small island developing states are saying, world agenda, listen to our concerns. This is one of the big ones, environmental change, climate change, rising sea levels. Those things, they're saying, underpin many of their development priorities. The next bullet point is quite obvious in a, in a sense. The first bit, limited human resources. If it's a small state by population, that means there's very few people. Limited number of people to lead the nation, to play the roles. You probably have to wear many hats if you're a leader in the society. In many cases, there are very few natural resources. Sometimes it's rich. What about the, the oil-rich Gulf states? What about Brunei in Southeast Asia? Very rich in oil reserves, so they may not all be lacking natural resources, but in many cases, that might be the situation. And this last point, I'm just giving you some characteristics, some flavor. I'm sort of trying to read, read between your eyes as well. Managed intimacy, this is a phrase that comes up in the literature time and time again. And many, many people in the comparative research community are saying that's really helpful to understand those situations. Managed in intimacy as a concept, it's saying because people all know each other in a small community, then the way things can operate, the way systems can operate, the way the public service can operate, actually has to take that on board. Your boss in an organization, if you live in the UK and you're working in London, you might never see them again. But your boss in the organization, if you're here in Mali, is probably your relative or a cousin. Or It, it makes a difference. It makes a difference. 
So what about my main topic now? Well, this is where we're going. I'm sort of focusing in a little bit. Um, yeah. Previous work on small states, this is scholarship in any discipline. It didn't begin with education. In fact, it was actually stimulated and started by finance ministers for the Commonwealth coming together in the late 70s, early 80s, and saying, planning our small state economies. And of course, think where I am. I'm talking about late 70s, early 80s. Many new small states had just been born. The decolonization process. So there was a sudden growth of new nation states. And many of those new nation states were small in population number. But the finance ministers got together and said, we better talk to each other instead of one you know, we're all inventing the wheel, let's get together. And that started people researching, supporting those sorts of development planning processes. So politics, economics, the field of research in small states goes back the longest, goes back into those 60s, 70s in terms of tradition. You've got to wait until the 1980s before anybody really was publishing anything of declared substance that was focused on education in small states. And it was your part of the world where it began. And it was the Commonwealth as an agency that pulled together small states again. And education ministers, it was an education ministers meeting, a Commonwealth education ministers meeting that was held in Mauritius. And it was that meeting that led to it was 1985, it was that led to this book, which was a seminal, a starting book on education and development in small states by Kazim Bakas, a national from, uh, gosh, I'm forgetting the name of the country now, on the, no on the northern tip of southern Africa, Guyana, Guyana, national of Guyana, good friend of mine, sadly passed away, but he was a founder found a researcher, and he was from a small state, which was great, working with Colin Brock, who's currently at the University of Oxford. So Bacchus and Brock is really the, the father of the research, the founding fathers of research in small states. Mark Bray, Professor Bray, has been involved in this work for a long time, but so have I, and, and Mark Bray and I both worked at the University of Papua New Guinea together, so we've been friends ever since. Um, but by 1999, the Commonwealth was saying, we've done a lot of work on education research, in, on education in small states. We've supported ministries of education. We've held conferences. We've had planning meetings. We've had strategic sort of plans that have helped small states develop education systems. We need a review. What have we achieved? What are the gaps? What are the limitations? And where do we go next? And at that stage, I was invited to lead that review. And one of my doctoral students, someone called Keith Holmes, who's now, of course, Dr. Keith Holmes, joined me as a research fellow on that project. So we did a review of the achievements and the gaps and the things that needed doing, a critical review of Commonwealth work on small states in education. And that was in 1999. So, 99, what about this book? I'm talking about a different study, and I'm changing gear again now, so we're going to focus very specifically upon recent research. This study, and again, I'm pleased about the origins of this study. It began, well, it began in 2008. It says 2009 on the screen, but it began in 2008 when a meeting for Commonwealth education ministers again, they happen every three years, and they move around Commonwealth countries, in, in 90, uh, sorry, uh, 2009, that CCEM was held close by in KL, Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia. But prior to that, we were commissioned as a research group to, to update the Crossley and Holmes review a decade later. Times have changed. Ministers wanted some help this is ministers from Commonwealth small states wanted some help to try to assist their forward planning for education in the small states of the Commonwealth. 
So first of all, we began a study to prepare a 